I'm excited this morning because we're back in the book of Matthew. How many people does that make excited? Just me? Oh, yes. It means you're back in this book. If you're, if you're new with us, you probably don't have one of these. I think we've got some extra out there if you'd like to grab one. We started these. It's got one page of scripture on the left and then a place for notes on the right. We started this when we started this series just a little bit ago. <laughs> Some of you don't laugh at that. It's not funny. Hey, what about this? When there is a will, there's a relative. I burned uh, 2,000 calories yesterday. It's the last time I take a nap with the brownies in the oven. That's a good one, right? Maybe I should pray. All right, let's pray and we'll start. Father, I just thank you for today. Lord, I thank you that this morning we get to come into your house. We get to worship you. We get to just stand in awe at all the things that you have done. Lord, this morning we get to add to our family here at WCC. I pray that you'd be with me this morning as I speak, Lord. I pray that I would speak the words that you have given us for your people. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Smith Wigglesworth was a plumber that was born in 1859 in Yorkshire, England. He was also a very well-known evangelist. In 1907, he began a church called the Boland Mission. In 1913, he had his wife, she passed away, and he began an international mission all across the world. He was known for his passion. He was known for his desperation to see Jesus work in the lives of people. He was known as one of the leaders of the Holy Rollers movement. I'm sure there are many in Pentecostal circles today that would be surprised to find out that it was a Brit that actually started much of this movement. Smith actually believed, come here for a second, Daniel. I didn't tell him I was going to bring him up here. Come here for a second. Smith actually believed if you had an ailment in your body, that it was the devil in your body, right? So hold on, not him. So let's, let's say he's got a sore elbow. He believed that the devil was actually in your elbow. So what he would do is he believed that when he was praying over that, that he was actually fighting the devil. So he would strike it. I mean, he would hit wherever you had. You can sit down now, yeah. (laughs) He would hit wherever you had the ailment in your body. Now, about a week and a half ago, some members of the church had a car wreck. I couldn't imagine walking in, and as they get wheeled into the room, and they're sore, and they're hurting, I just walk over, and I say, be healed in Jesus' name, and just strike them right where they hurt. But that's what Smith did. He believed that he was fighting against the forces of evil. Now, The Pentecostal Evangel was a paper that wrote, and here's what it said in 1935 about Smith Wigglesworth. It said, a man with cancer on his face and hands was healed almost instantly when Smith struck him in the face. A woman with a hernia of 17 years standing was completely delivered when he hit her in the herniated spot. A man with asthma of eight years standing was saved and healed instantly. When he smacked him in the back. The most famous story of all, probably, of Smith Wigglesworth was a story of when he was walking with one of his pastor friends who had just had a member of their congregation who had passed away. So they're going to the funeral, and at the time, the funeral home that they were in, between where you would sit and where the casket was, there were glass doors. So they come in, and he said, immediately Smith walks straight through around everybody and goes straight into where the casket is. And I hope you guys see where this is going. And he walks up to the casket, because that's normal so far. 
And he grabs the man and pulls him out. And he sits him against the wall. And he says, by the blood of Jesus, I command you to get up. And the man just fell. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the moment when my faith is gone. And I'm like running out the door, but he wasn't deterred. He, he bent over and picked the man up and set him back against the wall. And he said, by the blood of Jesus, I command you to wake up. And the man just kind of fell off the wall. And listen, this is where most of our faith in America, when it comes to, to miraculous stories where it ends, we tend to see these things and we kind of just walk away. We don't believe that it happens anymore. So in our story, that's where it ends. What if I told you that's not where the story ended? Not deterred, for the third time, Smith picks this man up and he throws him against the wall and he says, and by the blood of Jesus, I command you to wake up. And he and the man walk out of the glass doors together. They said, surprisingly enough, no one wanted to talk to either one of them as they walked out. Because sometimes when God does good things in your life, People avoid you. Sometimes when God is doing good things in your life, people avoid you. And today as we get into this story, you're going to think that this is a story about God's power. And listen, this story is most definitely about God's power. And I want you to know God's power more than anything in this world. But what this story is really about, it's about the desperation of two people. Let's pick this story up. Matthew 9, 18 through 26. We'll read the whole story. It says this, While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt down before him, saying, My daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had su suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I'll be made well. Jesus turned, seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd, out, when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. See, this story is so interesting because these people, these women are so different. Like, they couldn't be more different. Their ages are different. They're from two totally different classes of people. But Matthew has chose to put these two stories together. I think that the most important thing that you can see that the things that these women have in common is their desperation for Jesus. There was a desperation for Jesus in this story. And the word desperate literally means little or no hope. So when you become desperate for Jesus, it means you have little to no hope elsewhere. It means you see the truth that Jesus is the only true option. And we see these stories, and perhaps we can't see the connection. We might have an issue of blood that we're dealing with. You're not dead. Some of you are asleep, but not like Jesus talked about. You're just resting your eyes. That's what my dad used to tell me. But we all have problems that need fixed. 
Some of us have messed up marriages. Our marriages are distant. It's become routine. Everything your spouse does gets on your ever-loving nerves. You're just doing it for the kids or whatever. You've tried everything. You've tried marriage counseling. You've read all the books. And you're completely hopeless. Or maybe your finances are a mess. You're living paycheck to paycheck with no hope of anything ever getting better. Somehow your debt snowball has begun to roll uphill at you. And you're stuck. Or maybe something in your health is wrong. You've been dealing with it every way that you know how. Doctors can't quite figure it out. And you've resorted to the fact that you're just going to have to live that way the rest of your life hopeless what if I told you that in every one of these cases that is exactly where God needs you to be he needs you to be desperate he needs you to have no hope left no other options only then can you truly depend on him. I know some of you think when it comes to healings and all the gifts that they died with Jesus or maybe you think they were only for the apostles and if that were the case that what Paul wrote about when he wrote about them in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and Ephesians 4, if it means that all those things, when he's talking about all the gifts, if all those things are only for the apostles, that means the entirety of those books are only for the apostles. That means that all the promises that you hold on to in those books cannot be any good for you. Just the apostles. But that's not the case. Anyhow, this isn't a message about gifts. This is a message about the need and the desperation that we need to have for Jesus. Here are a couple of things that I think that we can learn about being desperate for Jesus from this story. The first thing is this. The desperation needs humility. Desperation needs humility. Matthew 9 18 says, while he was saying these things to him, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before them, saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. I just want to kind of set this up for you for a moment. In this story, in this, Matthew's telling of the story, he's not concerned at all with the name of this ruler. If we read the story in Mark, we'll realize that this is Jairus. And let me just set the scene for you for a moment for what's going on. Jesus is inside eating with these guys while he should have been fasting. He's sitting at the table eating with these people and outside the Pharisees are watching. They're taking it all in. They're plotting. They're scheming. They're coming up with ideas about what they're going to do. And all of a sudden... This ruler pushes through the crowd on the outside, pushes through all the Pharisees standing around, and he's got to get to Jesus. And he pushes through, and he comes in, and he drops at Jesus' feet. And he's asking him to bring his daughter back to life. What I want you to notice is in Matthew's telling of this story, he leaves no gray area. He makes you know that this girl is dead from the very beginning. And Jairus was a well-respected leader. He would have been responsible for overseeing Sabbath services. He would have been responsible for organizing community events and probably securing resources for the operation of the synagogue. He would have been there and gotten the scrolls and furniture ready. He would have maintained the building. He was a man that would have been honored in his community. 
Jesus at the time, not so much. He was doing all these crazy things. And here he comes. Pushing through all these Pharisees, pushing through all these people that knew everything about him to get to Jesus. He didn't send a messenger. He didn't send an aid. He went himself. Why? Because he was desperate. He knew that Jesus was the only answer. And he was humble enough that he didn't care what anyone else thought. He needed Jesus. And he knew that there was nothing that was going to stand in his way. He certainly knew what walking toward Jesus in this way would have done to his status in the eyes of the Pharisees. He knew how this would mark him and his community from the time forward after that moment. He knew exactly what was going to happen. But he rushes in. And he humbles himself by kneeling in front of Jesus. But he's not the only one in this little story. If we look at Matthew 9, 20, it says this. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. Look, this woman was standing in the shadows hiding outside of the house. She was waiting. She wasn't afraid. She wasn't hiding because she was afraid. She was hiding out of humility. She had been menstruating for 12 straight years. And what you need to understand about this is in her community, it would have completely cut her off because she was completely unclean. She wasn't supposed to be in the presence of others because of the rituals of that day, she could make other people ceremonially unclean. So not only had she had to deal with the pain and the misery of her ailment. But the other side of that is she had to deal with losing community, with being completely cut off from her people. And if we're being honest, some of the issues that we talked about earlier, they can do the exact same thing to us. Our marriage problems can cut us off from the community that we were once a part of. Because what happens is when we start to fight, when things start to go bad, we start to withdraw from the people around us that care about us. We don't want them to see. We don't want them to know how messed up we really are. So we kind of hang on the outskirts because we're embarrassed, because our spouse is so awful. So it cuts us off. Our health can do the same thing as it did to to this woman. Not because we're ceremonially unclean. But sometimes we just don't want to share our sickness. So we withdraw. But this lady, she was humble. She didn't want people to be unclean. She was trying to stay back. So she thought maybe if she could just get a little bit closer to him, maybe it could take care of her problem. And the second thing I think we can learn from this story is this. Desperation takes determination. Matthew 9, 20 through 21 says this. She 
she had suffered for a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I touch his garment, I will be made well. She was determined to get there. There was nothing that was going to stop her. So she pushed through the crowd to get to Jesus. Jairus was so determined that he went himself to Jesus. He didn't send someone. Maybe his fear was if he sent someone, the message would get all messed up. Like a bad game of telephone. It wouldn't get there correctly, so he went himself. For some of us, there's some times in our lives that that we're just not even close to as determined as these guys were to get to Jesus. What we are determined to do is to get all of our worldly answers out of the way. Every single possible scenario that we can come up with, go to every single conference on marriage that we can ever hope about, go to all the different sponsoring events, everything that we can think of. Everything that this world tells you will fix your problem. We try everything first. But when it comes to pressing into Jesus, when it comes to serving your spouse, no matter how they treat you, When it comes to handling your finances in a godly way, even when it doesn't look like you're going to be able to do it, we just walk away. We don't keep pressing in. We're not determined to get closer. And what we learn from these stories is we have to be determined to press in to Jesus. I think if someone were to tell us that all we had to do to have things better in our lives was pray a little more, study a little bit more, spend more time in his word, and and we'll guarantee that you will have an answer to all of your problems. I think if somebody were to tell you, look, all you got to do, everything that's going on in your life right now, everything that you can't handle, all you have to do is spend a little bit more time in the word. Spend a little bit more time in prayer, press into Jesus, listen to what he has to say in this situation. I think if somebody were to tell you that that's all you had to do to get an answer, we would all say, okay. That's exactly what the Bible says. I'm not trying to preach prosperity gospel to you this morning. That's not what I'm saying. What I didn't say is if you spend a little bit more time in the word and you you pray a little bit more, that God will give you everything that you want. What I said was, if you spend a little more time in the word and you pray a little bit more, God will give you an answer. The problem is, is sometimes that answer we don't like too much. I think that fear is what stops us from pressing into God so much in the first place. God, I believe you can answer every prayer. God, I believe that you can tell me everything about my life, but if I pray, what if what I want's wrong? What if you don't give me what I really want and you just give me what I need and it doesn't line up? And I think that thought keeps us so 
often from pressing in. But the one thing that we need more than anything in this world is a desperation for Jesus. He is the answer that you're looking for. The third thing that I want you to know this morning is this. Desperation does not need Certainty. Desperation does not need certainty. I think that this is what what faith really is. This might be the most liberating thing, is that desperation, while it requires faith, it doesn't mean that you're going to have 100% certainty that you're doing it and it's going to happen as you move in. Like this lady... She believed that Jesus could heal her. I mean, you can tell that it's certain that this woman knew that Jesus had the answer to her problems. But at the same time, she was ready to get in and get out. You know, just in case. Just in case she moved in and nothing happened, she could get out and go back to where she came from. And no harm, no foul, right? She hadn't hurt anyone. No one had seen her. She hadn't made anybody unclean. She could just push in and get right back out. Now, she believed that Jesus could help her. But I think it's pretty obvious that she wasn't really certain about it. She was determined to get there to find out. She was determined to move in and see if that's what would happen. And listen, she gets there and Jesus does not condemn her for her lack of faith. He doesn't say, oh child, if you had only believed and came up to me and asked me, I would have made you well. Quite the opposite. He says, your faith has made you well. And listen, there's going to come a time in your life when you're going to have to come to Jesus knowing that he can fix your problem. Like knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is nothing in your life that is too hard or too far away from God that he can't fix it. And there's going to be some times in your life when you have to press in on Jesus and you're still not 100% sure it's going to happen. That's faith. We see from this woman... She came in, and it means that you just dive in and you believe that he's going to catch you. The same way that your children did when they were young and they were standing on the side of the pool and they just jump. Because you're there, and they believe that you will catch them. Sometimes even when you're not looking, they will jump in and they will dive at you even when they don't know if you're watching. And that's what we need. Listen, some of you in your marriages, you've run out of options. You've tried everything. Everything's miserable. It's time to turn to Jesus. 
to realize that he is the only answer. It means you're going to have to serve. Even when you get nothing in return. The same is true for our finances. If the worship team would come, there's going to come a day if you ever want to get out of the place that you're in. That you're going to have to start making decisions based upon what the Word tells you and not what the world tells you. Even when it looks like it won't work out, you follow his plan, knowing that he can do so much more. But the problem is, is that in the American church, We lack a desperation for the creator of all things. We have all the answers that we could ever possibly need. Will you stand with me this morning? This morning, I want to encourage you. And I want to invite you to put all of your faith in Jesus. Not just in some things, not just, not just when every other option runs out, Put him first as the answer to all of your problems. See what it does for your life. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the blessings that you give us. Lord, I thank you that you never give up on us. Lord, this morning, there's some of us in this place that we need to be desperate for you. Father, some of us here this morning, we've, we've got enough problems. The world has piled enough on us that, that we feel like we're crumbling. And this morning, Father, I pray that you would help our hearts turn to you. That we would turn to you and we would place all of our hope in you and what you can do. And Father, this morning, there's some of us here that that we have things so well that we, would, we, we could never truly be desperate for you. Father, I pray this morning that you would take some of those things away from all of us that keeps us from being desperate for you. Father, I realize how bold of a prayer that is. Father, I realize how hurtful that prayer can be. This morning, Father, I pray if it takes wounding us to get closer to you, that you allow us to be wounded. Father, I pray in our lives that, that we become so desperate that there is nothing in this world that we would put before you. Not our own comfort. Anything. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.